And welcome everybody back to the Law and Crime Network. This is the afternoon session. I'm Michael Bryant, along with Michael Corbonics and Liz Crotty. Good to have the experts with me here today. We got a lot going on. Okay, so I'm telling you, this is, this gets into the weeds pretty deeply, but I've got the perfect folks here to help us uh, get the weed whacker out and get through this stuff. Uh, first of all, uh, I got my doughs confused. That was about dough number two. Remember, she is the one that uh, had the allegations of rape found guilty as to Mr. Winslow, but there was also a an allegation of sodomy, which was uh, a hung jury. So that one is still before this new court. So let me start with you, Elizabeth. Um, seems to me that they're really, the judge is going out of his way to keep this testimony and evidence out, evidence of a boyfriend who was apparently with Jane Doe too at or about the time or within a number of hours of the alleged assault primarily because there's no indication that he, the boyfriend, had sodomy or anal intercourse with the girl as opposed to vaginal, which was a conviction for rape in the first trial. Am I close here? Yeah, I think because there's two different sex acts in, with one victim. So they've already found guilty on the, the one sex act is, and it was hung on the other. So is that, is that, do you think that's fair? Is it overbroad? What do you think? No, I think they're, it, it's eliminating a defense. Um, yes, it's, it, it's, it a, is. it's elim eliminating the defense, but it's saying the facts don't support the defense. So can you proactively eliminate a defense where it's saying, oh, there was other DNA this time, and sometimes you can't get DNA. When was that taken from people? There are mistakes that ha have been happen happening. So not giving the jury the full spectrum. I mean, I think it's a, it's it's a double-edged sword to also say. Well, in his first trial, he was found guilty of the rape in this case, not the, the sodomy. It's kind of like, well, you know, it's splitting hairs at this point. I mean, there's still a victim, and he was still f found guilty of violating that victim. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, the sodomy and the rape, it's kind of like... I think it's hard to parse those things yeah, out. And the reason is, I mean, I'm no expert here, but when there's sexual relations going on, assumingly consensual, Parts can get mixed around with other parts, even if you didn't intend to have anal intercourse. There's a chance there was some sort of contact, friction. And I know they talked about, well, the vaginal area had, uh, had some redness to it, but maybe the, the anal region wasn't affected. But Michael Corbonic, isn't it, is it really just foreclosing all possibilities of cross-contamination to just say that sexual encounter with the boyfriend never happened because, in theory, it wasn't anal? Well... <clears throat> The judge, I, I don't usually like to agree with prosecutors, but I think the prosecutors have this right in this instance because there's a statute, the Rape Shield Law. California obviously has the um, equivalent. I'm, I, I practice in New Jersey in the federal courts. And that there is a Rape Shield Law. And I think what the prosecutor aptly is doing is cutting the defense off from basically really saying, you know what, they're really trying to victim shame or you know, say she sleeps with other people, so she must have slept with him. And that's exactly what the rape shield law is meant to protect. It's a very fine line. It is. very fact-sensitive, fact but I, I, I think they're making this, the right call here. It could come back. I mean, this is the kind of thing where you preclude a defense of some sort, evidence of some sort that arguably could help the defendant. That, that's going to be ripe for at least grounds for appeal, whether successful or not. Well, you also don't know. I mean, a lot of times in pretrial motions, what may not be admissible today may be tomorrow because of the nature of the testimony comes out and whether or not a door is open. I think what the defense needs here to better articulate their argument was they really need an expert to say why this is such an important part of the defense. Yeah. Uh, without that, I think they're going to have a tough road to hoe. But, you know, just because you lose today on a motion doesn't mean you're going to lose tomorrow. As I say, these are living, breathing things, these trials, and it can always be revisited. And that is Jane Doe number two. I mean, you can just feel the pain she had just in reliving what was going on. And I guess we can call her officially a victim now. Remember, it was the rape count against Kellen Winslow based on action and interaction with this Jane Doe that led to that conviction. And now the second round will include just a sodomy charge. So Elizabeth Crotty, criminal defense attorney, is here with me, as is Michael Corbonix. And, and the question I have is, and the judge, we, we saw what the judge said for the, the, the second round, and now we see this witness. They're clearly talking about interactions other than the actual sexual encounter, like the hands around the throat. Why, Liz, would evidence of DNA or lack of DNA not be an issue when we're talking about testimony we know is coming in, the hands around the throat. I mean, I think, too, it's not scratching, which is, the, I think these things are very fact-driven, especially since you have 
they, you went to the testimony of the first first time she testified. She testified to going like this and, and and a choking more than a scratching. So I don't think that that necessarily means that there should be or should not be DNA under the fingernails. Obviously, they're trying to use her prior sexual act with her boyfriend to muddy the waters of what happened to her in this case, but I don't know it's, if it's the best strategy. So, law and crime analyst Michael Corbonix, time to do some law and crime analyzing for me here. It seems to me you got the right answer the first time, that the judge is really being very careful about any perceived victim shaming. But you got to admit, when there's some physical evidence like DNA, is there really that much harm in it coming in? I, I don't, I, I think what the judge is really worried about is the opening the door to other things as a result of that testimony and somehow frustrating the Rape Shield Act. If there are certain answers that are elicited about the DNA on the hands and what was recovered and things of that nature, it may open the door to get to where they're trying to avoid and bring them back to where they're trying to avoid. I really have a tough time understanding why the defense is pursuing this because they, they know what the law is, the statute's pretty clear. I don't see how confusing the jury on this issue is to their benefit. There's nothing better for a defense attorney to stand up and say, well, listen, you went for these examinations and there was no DNA. I mean, you hear people are very, very smart on juries. They, they watch CSI. They watch Law and Crime Network, so hopefully. Saying, okay, no DNA of the defendant. Check. Do you need anything more than that? Gotcha. That's a good point. Hey, I want to show you something. I was at the store. I went to an eyeglass store. I think it's called Good Optics. And uh, at the Corbonics Corner, I found these. What do you think? What do you think? They're all you, Mike. <laughs> it's from, from your signature collection, I believe. So, okay, we're going to take a quick break here and come back with more on this Kellen Winslow case. Uh, and they are amped and ready to go. Opening statements coming up. Stay right here.